when we were over at the cabin in Montana several weeks ago, my cousin Lance, who was working remotely at their cabin, and I had an opportunity to catch up, and it's been years. He told me that uh, he and his family had moved to Denver to continue working for an employer that called him there, but he wasn't all that enthused about living there. And then he was offered a different job that would allow him to live anywhere he wanted. So he took it. Unfortunately, by then, his wife had fallen in love with Denver. So there they remained. His new job, however, allowed him to come out to the cabin, as I said, and work remotely. His new job also periodically took him to Des Moines, Iowa, where they had another of their main offices. I say that because that's going to be important. So put a bookmark there. Jesus, it says, told them these parables. He did not tell these parables to the disciples, though obviously some of them were listening and overheard his words. Jesus first told these parables to certain people, certain leaders who were grumbling about the kind of folks that Jesus welcomed into his company. So I challenge you, if you are to truly hear and understand the lesson, we have to hear these verses as people who question the faith and resist the fellowship of other people, people who have been drawn to Jesus but are not necessarily the best people around. So start there. I know it's going to be hard for us because we have a welcome all kind of mindset. Well, try to get out of that mindset and put yourself into a who do they think they are mindset. Because these parables aren't for everyone. They're for folks who grumble about people different from us who are attracted to Jesus. So Jesus says, which one of you shepherds has lost a sheep? Would you not leave the 99 other sheep in the wilderness and go beat the bushes for that one lost sheep? And when you find that one lost sheep, which one of you would not put that sheep up on your shoulders and carry that sheep back to your friends and say, everybody come party with me. I have found my lost sheep. And he goes on. Which one of you women, if you lose a coin, would not rip all the carpet out of your home, move all the heavy appliances out into the yard, Move all the furniture out onto the porch. And when you have found that lost coin, which one of you would not run out into the street and yell, come party with me. I have found my lost coin. Which one of you would not do that? Well, think about it. The answer is none of us would do that. It's crazy. And then Jesus, the teller of these stories, says, excuse me, these are not stories about the way you behave. These are stories about the way God behaves. Get it? God is the seeking shepherd. God is the searching woman. Lance's father, my uncle Les, has lived in the Flathead Valley all of his adult life. And I would imagine he has driven up to Glacier Park at least a hundred times, at least a hundred times over the years, passing right through the little town of Hungry Horse. Now, some of you have driven through Hungry Horse. It's where they sell the huckleberries near the highway. Now, my uncle knew that he was always adopted. It was never a secret. But he had been raised by the most wonderful couple. So wonderful that he never felt the need to try to connect with his birth family. He knew, obviously, that he probably had some folks in this past that he had lost. But he really had no desire to find them. 
they said to Jesus, why do you always hang out with sinners? You're always eating and drinking with sinners. What kind of a religious person are you? After all, what's the point of religion except to separate people out, the sinful from the righteous? What are you doing with all these sinners? And Jesus answers, I came to seek and to save the lost. Think about that. That's a very different view of God and a very different view of ourselves. When most of us are thinking about ourselves and our faith, we say things like, well, see, I am searching for something, or I'm here because I'm looking for God. Well, fine, that's wonderful. But that's not the way the Bible normally tells it. In the Bible, and especially in the Gospels, it's God who is looking for us. And we believe as Christians that Jesus is God's supreme act of trying to come closer to us, of searching us and finding us. My cousin Lance did the, the DNA kit that some of you have probably done to, uh, first of all, find out some of his biological background, especially since he didn't have any record of his father's family, where they came from, how much of which country made up that family story, if there were any hidden health concerns. And so after doing that, lo and behold, he was contacted by a woman who told him that she thought she might be his cousin. Well, communicating back and forth, the woman told him that, now she didn't know for sure, but she seemed to remember way back in the recesses of her mind that there was a story she heard when she was very young about another child born to her grandmother. This is a child she had when she was a teenager. And you remember the days, and it was often the case back in those days, she was quickly whisked away to live in a home back in the Midwest run by nuns, Catholic nuns, who got her through her pregnancy and then put her child up for adoption. And that became the family secret. Well, you can guess the rest of the story. Les's mother had passed away a few years ago. The two brothers he had had already died. But there was a sister still living. After more, more back and forth, Les was able to contact uh, one of her sons, his nephew, to see how best to find the sister. As they were talking, it turns out his nephew is a Lutheran minister in Minnesota who traveled to Montana every summer to lead church camps near Hungry Horse. And found out his sister lives in Des Moines, Iowa. And since my cousin visits there for work, he's been able to have dinner with her on several occasions. And Les has traveled back to see her. And last I talked with him, he was trying to use some of his air miles to get her out to Montana. A whole entire family that was lost long ago and who remained lost up until just a few months ago. Some of whom, and this is what's wacky, some of whom had been within just a few miles of each other without knowing it. Jesus comes to town and we rent the Mount Baker Theater for his lecture. And that night all the important religious dignitaries are invited, a special section just for the clergy is up near the front and we're all decked out in all of our robes and stoles, ready to meet the man. But when it's time to begin, Jesus is nowhere to be found. And it's only after the police are contacted that he is located down on Holly Street at the homeless drop-in center, letting folks know that the kingdom of God is for them, among them, with them. And 
he leaves town without stopping at any of the churches. You see, Jesus came to save the lost. Lost sheep, lost coins, lost sisters, lost brothers, lost prostitutes. Jesus came all this way looking for them and those that we unfortunately sometimes have given up on or forgot about or dismissed because of their seeming unworthiness are the very ones that Jesus has headed out to look for. And I see him doing that and I see him looking back over his shoulder to see if we're following him. Remember what happens every time someone who is lost is found. Amazing grace. And a celebration for all because we are so inextricably bound to one another. Church leader to stranger, hungry to full, joyous to mean-spirited, faithless to faithful. And whenever a lost sheep gets found, we have an excuse to throw a party. At least that's the way Jesus sees it. Amen.